This happened back in 2021 on the Valentine's Day, just before the second wave of Pandemic 19. Most adults were vaccinated and slowly starting to venture out with their masks on, sanitizing constantly. There was the fear of another outbreak, another lockdown and comorbidities. It had been a year since I had any sort of human contact. I was not in the best place in my life. My boyfriend of six years had cheated on me in 2019 with one of my best friends. When I confronted him, he told me that he had already proposed to her, she had said yes, and that he was moving out. I was completely broken for two reasons. I had found the ring a few days ago and assumed it was for me. Secondly, because he had pursued me so vehemently during college that I was convinced that he wouldn't leave me ever. Even after we got together, he kept telling me that, you are the one for me. I had never been with anyone else my entire life of 24 years and trusted him deeply. I was devastated and alone. The pandemic added to my misery. During the lockdown in mid-2020, I saw the pictures of their intimate wedding, held at their apartment, with all my close friends in attendance. It broke me and I distanced myself from the handful of friends that I had. The only solace of my life was my art, my job and the stray cat that followed me home while coming back from a grocery shop. I named him Jazz due to his erratic rhythm while purring. I had decided to pull myself together for the new year of 2021 and that this was going to be my year. I decided that I needed new people in my life. I could only find dating applications online. But when I searched further, I found an app called Humpkin, as in Human Connection. It was in beta phase, so free and based on compatibility of your biology, especially blood type. I was intrigued. After reading some articles posted by the app on this topic, I was convinced that people of similar biology stick together. The application had a welcome page with some harmless personality and health-based questions. The reports it generated based on these was astonishingly accurate. It categorized me as introverted, predicted my food preferences, and even suggested restaurants and bars which would suit me from my city. I was gasping at the accuracy of the predictions and feeling a little queasy when my phone dinged with a notification from the app, a handshake from a person named Robbie. I read the report on this person. They seemed to have the same blood group and matched my health profile. The app didn't support photos of more than 100 kilobytes, and the person had not specified their gender. It was apparently a policy of the developers to not base your choice of friendships and partners on superficial details. I dared myself to accept the handshake. They were charming and extremely polite while texting on the app. I shared my art with them. They appreciated my work and said that they could feel the deep pain hidden in my work. I hadn't felt so respected and seen in a very long time. They asked if I was comfortable to meet with them on the coming Sunday. I checked my calendar and realized that Sunday was the Valentine's Day. I hesitated for a moment, but I had promised myself to have new experiences this year, and I was partially happy thinking that I won't be alone on Valentine's. I said yes after taking my time, and they were extremely chill about it. They suggested that we should try out one of the cafes that the app had suggested. I agreed. I was smiling to myself after a long time. I imagined them to be an older female who was very caring, whom I would become best friends forever with on our first meeting. We met at the cafe on Valentine's Day evening. It was sort of empty, I assumed due to COVID and how far it was from the city. My next surprise was when they removed their hoodie. It was a pale, tall guy with a very charming smile. I was a little disappointed, but also sort of happy. He was a perfect gentleman. He held the door, pulled my chair, and was considerate while ordering. I felt so relaxed around him. I was happy that I made this decision. The application was not meant for dating, but this casual meeting felt like a date. As the night progressed, I found myself falling for him. As it got darker, we decided to a walk to a pub, listed on the app on the seaside. We walked the streets holding hands like an old married couple. He listened intently to all my stories. It was so easy to talk to him that I spoke about my previous relationship and break up for the very first time to someone. I decided to have a light dinner at the pub while he drank some red wine and sat looking at me lovingly while I continued to talk. 
he offered to walk me back home. I felt that both of us were walking slower like we didn't want this meeting to end. When I was about to say goodbye, he looked deeply into my eyes and said something. All I heard was a sound like the ringing of glass and that he liked me very much. I thought it was something from the nearby diner which was buzzing with lovey-dovey couples. I had this strong urge to invite him in. We went upstairs and started kissing. It felt like I was getting intoxicated by the wine he drank. I heard that glassy voice again. He whispered into my ear, you are the one for me. The hurtful memories of my past relationship came back flooding into my mind and it felt like I snapped out of a daze. I looked into the mirror and I couldn't see his reflection, but when I looked back he was too close to my neck. I noticed with shock that how his mouth had sharp fangs and too many teeth. I could barely make eye contact, it burnt. His bright red gaze was melting my insides into mush, but not due to love this time. I shut my eyes tightly and screamed while trying to free myself. His grip was too strong. I saw Jazz in my peripheral vision. He was standing by the door in attack mode, hissing this whole time. I screamed at him to leave and save himself but my guardian angel jumped on the monster. I freed myself, picked up Jazz, and ran straight out. I sat down under the street light near the crowded diner opposite my apartment with Jazz on my lap. Jazz was shaking, but in his protective hyper-alert mode, he intently stared at my bedroom window above. A pair of eyes, like spots from a laser pointer, were looking back at us. I had made the mistake of inviting something not so human into my house. I looked down and covered Jazz with my jacket. The exertion of the night had tired me. I dozed off. When I woke up, Jazz seemed relaxed, which gave me some courage to look up. I went back to my apartment. I felt that he was waiting for the sunset to come back. I packed my bags and drove to my parents' house. I hadn't told them about my breakup yet. I decided to make that my reason to come home. My mother hugged me tight and consoled me. She made my favorite soup. Me and Jazz were relaxed by now. We had left the monster behind. I slept soundly. In the middle of the night, I woke up sweating. I had had a nightmare. I got out of my bed and found the window open. And there it was, sitting on the tree, right outside my window, staring at me with its fiery eyes. It started speaking in its glassy voice, commanding me to invite it in. It has been two years since. It still stares at me from the tree every night. I try to shield myself by not opening the window, blackout curtains, headphones, loud music, and whatnot. I work from home now and never get out of my house. My parents ask me to go for therapy. They think that I am depressed due to the breakup. The Humpkin app seems to have disappeared into thin air. I can't even locate the restaurants it had suggested. Jazz is always on high alert after sunset, and some nights, when the voices are loud, he cries with a fervor, like he is in pain. I cannot take this anymore. And now, I am getting rash-like burn marks on the side of my body facing the window. Doctors think it's long COVID. But I know it is not. I don't know what to do. Should I tell my parents and get help? But will they believe me? My boyfriend is currently being stalked and harassed by an ex. It's clearly stressing him the F out, and he hates it. He has told her numerous times he does not want to remain in touch with her, but she will not relent, even claiming that she did not respect his boundaries because they didn't seem fair to her. The ex has won over his mother, works at his workplace, inserted herself into the small local deaf community he is deaf, she is not and seems intent on continuing to force herself into his life. And he is too nice to do anything but continue asking her nicely to stop, fearing what he will have to deal with from his mother, who likes her if he is any harsher, blocks her number, etc. I had a boyfriend who lived two and a half hours away. He was in the army and would drive over and get me on the Friday night, bring me to his parents' house for the weekend, and take me home on the Sunday. I was 16, he was 18. We'd been together for about three months when I was at his on the weekend, 
and he had spent the entire time on an FPS on his PC playing online with his friend who lived ten doors down the road, if that. Now he said this was his best friend who was being deployed, and he wanted to spend some quality time together. I said I understood, and that he should have warned me and I wouldn't have come over. He went mental. Long story short, we broke up. I made it clear that there were no backsies, and I'd been thinking about it before this latest visit anyway. Guy drove all the way to my hometown, drove around till he found my 14-year-old sister, and her mates at the park implied them with cider, so she'd tell him where I was and what I had been up to. Luckily I was away somewhere, and he couldn't find me. I found him on MySpace a year or so later, and he had a photo of me on there entitled, The One Who Got Away. Now I'm 23, he's 25. He's married with two children. He added me on Facebook last month. This is my stalker story, and I lived. So far. My freshman year of college was one of the funnest years of my life, and some of my fondest memories are from that year. But it was also the scariest and strangest year to date, I'm 31 now. This is thanks to one story in particular, there are actually a couple more that I might post some other time that takes place over the entire school year. I still sometimes wonder how this really happened, and I didn't end up a shut-in nut job, and it still freaks me out to this day. I've only talked about it once or twice since it happened 13 years ago. I'm changing names of people and places because, yeah. August 2001, like most freshmen, I live in the dorms at a state party school. I opted out of the good school I got into. I guess I had a little steam to blow off after graduating from a military and college prep boarding school. Plus, after a sports injury, I didn't exactly have any specific plan for life that went past Saturday night, if you know what I mean. A good buddy from military school, we'll call him Bill, went to same college and lived a few floors below in the same dorm as me. So of course we were getting the party started before my parents' exhaust fumes had even evaporated from the parking lot. For the most part, the first month or so of college was pretty much like that normal. I went to most of my classes, partied just about every night, chased girls around, and that was enough for the moment. But things began to change one night sometime in mid-September, and college for me would never be normal again. My dorm phone landline, only Zach Morris carried a cell phone in 2001 get over it. Rings in the middle of the night, hello. On the other end, I can only really describe the voice as the kind you picture when you think about a computer talking. Kinda like the early model car GPSs. Hi, we'll call me Gary, how are you today? Not fully awake, I'm just confused at this point. Who is this? He repeats. Hi Gary, how are you today? It becomes clear I'm being effed with so I hang up and chuckle Bill, nice one I pass back out. I end up forgetting about the call for a few days and never mention mention to Bill or anyone else. About a week later, I get another call around the same time of night. Hi Gary, I'm watching you. Nice, very cliche. Seriously Bill, how are you not knee deep in Everclear or a try delta at this hour? Enough already, Cade roommate is going to start getting pissed. I hang up. I casually confront my oh-so-clever amigo at breakfast the next morning, purposely not trying to bite too hard to give him a payoff that might incentivize continued calls. I also wasn't 100% it was actually him and not another one of my douchebag friends. He gives a genuinely confused response. Whatever. So a couple days after second call, I come home and see I had multiple messages on my answering machine. WTF, I barely knew that thing even worked. It's computer voice guy CVG. Message 1. My machine cuts off first 1-2 seconds of message, which tells me it's a bot set to play message upon answer. Hi Gary, I'm watching you. Message 2. I thought I asked you to answer my calls, Gary. Message 3. Where might Gary be on a Tuesday night? Okay, so one of my friends is clearly asshole or bored enough to really push for a reaction here. The next day, I play the messages for Cade, who was around during the calls which were apparently earlier in the night when he was still awake. He'd been a close buddy since we were in junior high, but we'd sorta of taken separate paths after high school. 
So anyway, he's aware I'm a wild child and thinks nothing of the first couple messages. By third, he's a little spooked. I then walk down to a couple other buddies' rooms and casually, but immediately bring up the subject. Nada. Over the next couple of days, I press all close and semi-close friends, but get zero answers and zero suspects. The calls start coming more frequently over the next couple months, starting at once a week, then to once every two, three days, up to every day by Christmas break. I don't say anything to my family at that point, although I really, really should have. What started out as a decent beginning of college turned into not showing up for any classes, tests, nothing. Grades reflect, and I am too busy answering for a 067 GPA to talk about some dumb prank that would likely be dismissed as a pathetic attempt at grades explanation. So it goes. Uneventful break, and back to school determined to become a new man. I gotta get my shit together with these grades, so I tell Bill I'm gonna have to chill out and focus on school. First night back, I get my first spring semester call from CVG. How is your family in Cyprus, hometown suburb? Okay, now this is bullshit man. What kind of douche lords am I hanging out with that even have the discipline to drag out a prank this long? I get the answer to that question a few days later, and the answer is none of them. Calls become threatening and downright dark. I'm very interested, Gary, in being close to you. Yeah, with kind of a weird sentence structure like that. I have tools I can bring. It is going to all be over soon. One day I bring Bill and all my other buddies up to hear the messages never deleted a single one for some reason. I guess when things happen over longer periods of time, you don't really feel the cumulative impact until laying out the complete package of evidence. The guys are in shock. I guess I should mention that some of these calls got really specific in making sure to note specific details about my parents' address, as well as the violence they are planning on doing to me. Cut open your esophagus Gary with a butter knife, and all sorts of other crap that is sort of blurred together through the hundreds upon hundreds of calls I got over the school year. A chick friend of mine that I'd really liked in high school goes to a different school hundreds of miles away. We've reconnected thanks to good ol' AIM and talked from time to time on the phone. CVG had mentioned a couple of times your friend and made threats about this unspecified person from time to time, but your friend turned into we'll call her Layla, your friend Layla. Layla and I are the only two people ever named in these calls, but it did get me wondering if this was a new lead to the source. Layla is clueless when I call her about it. Awesome. I know that background was long to read, but you'll understand why I had to explain the situation when I tell you about what happens next. One night, we're all partying and drinking at some hotel forgot to mention, all that straight a crap went out the window as these events progressed. A different buddy Carl has a nice big truck we'd all go everywhere in, but he passed out drunk at the hotel after pounding an entire bottle of Whatever FX. I'm not really drinking tonight, and want to get back to my own bed. I snatch Carl's keys to drive back to campus, thinking I'll drive back in the morning to get everyone. This was one of the few times I'd even driven that year, so I wasn't tip-top on my directions. I make an early turn and am somehow down a road I've never seen. I realize this pretty quick, but I figure I've got the general direction of campus pegged so I can just continue the wrong road until hitting the familiar highway that I knew I'd eventually have to hit that is close to campus. I'm finding myself in open fields paved road and everything, but aside from the road there was absolutely nothing, and it was completely black. Around 3 a.m., there's this really strange four-way stop I come upon. Strange because I'm probably the fourth person in a year to drive on that road unnecessary. Anyway, I trudge along, eventually get to the familiar highway, and home free. A few days later, CVG interrupts his usual depraved threatening to mention that specific four-way day and time that I was on it, which like I said was around 3 a.m. and there wasn't a soul in sight. So yeah, I now realize CVG is obviously tracking my movements somehow. Note. I later joined the military worked in the intelligence community and worked special operations and tracked bad guys all around the world to this day. I still can't figure out how this dude knew I was in the middle of those fields on that date in the middle of the night. 
I never mentioned it to anyone. Around March, this apparent rendezvous became CVG's focal point, and he'd make sure to let me know the day way close. The calls were coming in no fewer than 10 or 15 every single day. Seriously. The ringer was now off out of courtesy to Cade, and I turned down the volume of answering machine as his phone calls recorded. But I finally get the message I'd been waiting for. Keep in mind, I've now become somewhat famous infamous. At this university by now because of CVG, people were constantly knocking on my door wanting to hear the messages. Friend of a friend of whomever I know. It was all people wanted to hear about at parties. Blah blah blah, for a split second it was cool because I'm pretty sure I ended up getting laid a couple times indirectly from introductions conceived through interest in the guy with the stalker. Don't judge me. Moving right along, the day, time, location are set. We will meet in front of Coleman Hall at midnight Wednesday 27 April, and we will take our friendship to the next level. I know what you are thinking, and yeah, throughout the year I had considered the possibility that I was dealing with a female. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, and I was definitely that kind of dude when I was 18-19 years old the kind that could attracted clinginess and anger. But I started to rule out female for various reasons that only a fellow inf would understand look it up if you're not tracking. I can build profiles with a very high ratio of accuracy to available information. This creep just didn't feel like a female to me. It didn't even feel like a peer. I was convinced I was dealing with mid-thirties white male computer nerd that I'd come into contact with at some point in my life. Doesn't really matter. Because what I ended up finding out on Wednesday 27 April, which, by the way, was Layla's birthday. Interesting I was wrong. Of course everyone wants to be part of this juicy story, and there's a pretty ridiculous amount of testosterone floating around the dorm on game day. This was a real-life creepster, and a legit horror story unfolding before their very eyes, and groupthink will subvert caution if property motivated. These guys are ready to defend me with their lives, just ask them. So while these monkeys are getting all hopped up on Mountain Dew, I stay home that afternoon wondering what the FX I was going to do at midnight. Of course I was going to go, but dude. Yeah, I've always been an all feet in good shape, wrestling, football, and baseball teams, yada yada. But I'm still a 19-year-old white male, good parents, grew up middle-upper-class white suburbia, had a good life. In other words, I can definitely hold my own in a street fight. But this whatever this is doesn't feel anything like a street fight or any other kind of fight I'd been in. This is a disturbed, violent, angry, possibly grown-ass psychopath that has decided to dedicate almost a full year now of his life to targeting and terrorizing me. So yeah, I'm a little friggin' nervous. My home team crowd steadily built up throughout the afternoon and evening with probably close to 70 or 80 guys grouped up at our dorm's common area. We were connected to the female dorm at the first floor, smoking cigarettes and talking about beating the SX out of people and getting messed up and all the other generic cliches X you can imagine. Once the party hour approaches though, over half of the guys splinter off into other various propositions that probably included more traditional fun like beer bongs and sorority girls. I'm left with about a 15-20 member platoon. I had decided earlier that I was not going to allow all these knuckleheads to shadow me, but I could definitely use them in case of emergency. I didn't want to risk him spooking out of the meat, so I let them know they will need to stay inside the doors of the common area while I walk out to the meeting spot. Coleman Hall was adjacent to our connected girls' dorm, and about 300 paces outside door to door to get to Coleman. The witching hour came, so I leave the crew to begin the longest couple hundred or so paces of my life. My boys can see me through the glass doors, but wouldn't really be able to see much once I get to the Coleman Hall door. Insert link about 100 paces out from my spot, I observe two things at the same time. One some kind of small quick movement in front of the patio walkway that goes all the way around the building and two the movement was in a spot along the walkway where the only normally uber bright bulb is out. I'm not exactly sure exactly how I was able to see him, but I suddenly realize someone is crouched behind one of the contiguous cookie cutter bushes outside the patio perimeter against one of the building pillars. In dark clothes and hoodie, 
He is a few feet off from the path where I'm supposed to meet him, and positioned to where I really should not have been able to see him, given the pillar blocking any shadow plus the burned out I later found out smashed light. In fact, I could have easily walked all the way to the door without ever have noticed someone down there. Nope. I sort of jump mid-step as this happens, and I see him raise up a little thinking I might have seen him. I see him raise up and take a step toward me, and fight or flight hits. I've learned that my particular fight or flight chooses fight in more mild situations, flight during intense situations, but for us X your pants situations, it's scarier to run away with your back to whatever scaries X I'm dealing with so I fight. Before I realize what I'm doing, I'm in a dead sprint toward this meth, who I'm guessing sees what I can't yet, which is my platoon busting through the glass doors in hot pursuit. Creepster nopes the F out of there, running on the patio alongside Coleman Hall toward the parking lot insert or refer to picture link again. I can tell this isn't the mid-30s computer nerd I predicted. Creepster is above average height, above average broad, and build athletically. That's all I could tell, really. I'm not even sure if he was white, because he was at least tan, if not Hispanic, Middle Eastern, etc. I'm really booking it as he right turns on a dime at the edge of the building. I realize I'm moving fast enough to catch him, but everyone else is really far behind. I also realize I'm moving so fast I won't be protected as I turn hard right at the corner of the building. If he stops there, I'm toast. As I turn the corner, I see the van sitting alone in the parking lot in front of me. It's running and brake lights flicker on then off park into drive and begins inching forward toward the exit. Holmesless is of course heading for the van, which for some reason sent this whole new level of fear into me. This is it, this is really happening, and I'm going to get murdered tonight. But I can't stop, something keeps me moving forward. I guess I'd come this far, dealt with this crazy BS for almost a full year now, completely unable to do anything other than try to ignore it. I'm not exactly going places academically at this point, and my life doesn't quite have all that much purpose to it yet. If I am going to get schwacked, I will at least know and this crap will at least be over. Plus, I still have a chance to catch this madman before he gets away. If I could get close enough to dive tackle, I would still be on my own to deal with the creepster, his driver, and now I realize there's a third one that was manning the sliding side door. Awesome. I don't care how badass you think you are when you're a 19-year-old jock, your chances of taking down three grown men that are already violent criminals and prepared to victimize are about one and not gonna happen buddy. My turn is wide and slow due to being full on sprint, and I lose ground. I'm probably 20 yards from the lot when he does a flying leap into the side of the van. There couldn't have been any rows of seats for a leap like that. Creepster 3 slams sliding door shut as van peels out of the parking lot, bangs are right and gone in an instant. The relief of not being kidnapped bound and gagged in that van with three psychos who most likely had some pretty horrific plans for me is now just as strong as the dread of the fact that this is still not over with. I was speechless, and so was my platoon as they catch up a minute later. A few of them caught up enough to witness the parking lot scene, but no one was talking. Testosterone has now been replaced with genuine and earnest concern. They all just stood there with me, catching their breath and making sure I was alright. One guy asks if anyone got a plate number, not even I did. Not enough light. We finally start walking back and I'm reliving the scene as we retrace our steps. As we get closer to the original meeting spot, I see something that scares me more than anything else in the entire equation has up to this point. On the opposite side of the pillar where Creepy McCreeperson was crouching, there's a video camera sitting on a stand pointed right at the spot I would have been standing at when I should have not been able to notice him. It's still recording. Somewhere around ninth grade, I broke up with this boy I was dating, who at first seemed normal. He had English with one of my friends and seemed to like her until finding out she had a boyfriend. That's when he moved on to me. He texted me a few times, and I only thought of him as a friend. However, he he thought of it as more and told everyone we were dating. Excluding me of course not knowing what to do, 
I just went along with it and broke up with him for the first time about a month later. He decided otherwise and told everyone we were back together. So again, I break up with him about a month later. Except this time he doesn't tell anyone we're back together. Instead he sends me pictures of his dick. What a guy. This is 10-15 years ago. Not my ex-boyfriend, but my cousin's girlfriend at the time's ex. He would follow her everywhere because he wanted to be with her, but she wasn't interested. Her ex didn't like that she was seeing a new man my cousin. One day my cousin dropped her off on the front steps of her workplace. I think she worked at a bank, but I don't remember. He drove away and thought nothing of it. He later received a phone call from the police that she had been killed on the steps of her workplace by her ex-boyfriend as soon as my cousin had driven out of sight. Her ex had been hiding in the bushes waiting for her. My cousin hung and killed himself a few weeks later because he couldn't deal with it. He felt like it was his fault for not waiting and watching her go inside. In all reality though, she probably would have been killed by her ex one way or another. This was in Toronto. I wish I could find an article. I may be fuzzy on the details. I was relatively young when it happened. I had a friend claim to me that he thought we were dating all through college, helping each other with homework, hanging out with mutual friends. I was literally married to my current husband the last few months, and stalker guy didn't break it to me that he thought I was just hardcore, friend zoning him until graduation. I told him from the get-go that I wasn't attracted to him. Last I knew, he joined the military because my husband was in the military. He's probably reading this right now, and if so, I'd like to emphasize to him that sometimes people are just nice to each other, and just because I was a woman who was friendly with a man I never, ever owed him anything more than that. And that is the story of why I never made friends with a man again. Oh, and also of why I vomit a little each time I hear the term friend zone. I will never date a cop again. I swear that half the force was reporting on everything I did, even after I broke up with him. After we split, I got a flat tire and saw four cops sitting in their cars watching me as I changed it. Twenty minutes in, my cell rang, and it was my ex asking, Do you need help with that flat tire? Cop cars driving down my street too often, and always slowed as they passed my house. A bug was found in my house phone. A cop car was usually behind me as I drove the list goes on and on. About eight months after I broke it off, I finally told my brothers what was going on. I don't know what they did, but it all stopped two days later. What started as a typical New Year's Eve gig at a newly renovated hole in the wall has become something far worse. I'm the bass player insert punchline here. I'm pretty good too, although I only play part-time. Back in the day, I played with Velvet on Fire. You won't remember us. We played one gig. For six people. Then our singer, Rod Brimstone, leapt onto someone's table and urinated. Talk about game over. But I digress. My latest group, a blues rock cover band called Falling Forward, was hired to perform three sets of music. The trouble started when the redhead arrived. I was at the bar, minding my own business, when out of the blue, a radiant redhead, clad entirely in black leather, grabbed my ass. Whatcha drinking? Her voice sounded like an ashtray. She was tall, with emerald eyes and a sleeve of tattoos. I did a double take. Um, I gulped. Whatever you're buying. She winked, twirled her lip ring, then slid her icy fingers between my legs. Subtlety was not her strength. The beer arrived and we cheersed. She said her name was Rosetta. I introduced myself as Derek the bass player while forcing her hand further north. Then, after some throwaway small talk, I sauntered towards the stage, more than ready for the band's third and final set. Falling forward played a raucous set. Mick, the lead singer and harmonica player, worked the audience into a frenzy. Leading the party was Rosetta, 
dancing sexily, swinging her hips to and fro, fist pumping and cat calling. When the band finished its final set, I started loading the gear into Mick's van. I was exhausted, with little patience for patronizing drunks, pestering me. Despite this, the redhead came strutting over. Next thing I know, I'm slow dancing to every rose has its thorn via karaoke. Ugh. I didn't know which was worse. The drunken, out-of-tune singing, or being forced to dance to it. Her perfume smelled like sweet summer rain, but her exploring hands were icebergs. We wiggled and wormed along the crowded dance floor until finally and thankfully the song ended. Next came the tequila. Things get blurry by this point. Somehow, despite the redhead's relentless flirting, I finished loading the gear and Mick drove me home. She must have gotten my phone number because the following morning I awoke to a flashing phone and one hell of a hangover. Hey handsome, the redhead texted, come over. Included was a video of her masturbating. Not gonna lie, I was kinda turned on. Don't judge. It had been a while since I'd had sex. My hormones got the best of me. Still, I had my reservations. Rosetta was a bit over the top for my tastes. And that's putting it mildly. So I reached out to Mick, asking for advice. His reply was instantaneous. Strike while the kettle's hot. And that's exactly what I did. Rosetta greeted me with opened arms and ruby lips. Her perfume was potent, her green eyes sparkling with bad intentions. She led me into her bedroom. To my dismay, Velvet on Fire's one and only event poster was pasted onto her her wall, below a giant nine-inch nails poster. I gulped. She was one of the six who saw my old band. I love music, she said softly, in between kisses. Then she got to work. I left her apartment thinking I would never see her again. Unfortunately, this was not the case. The redhead was relentless, texting me day and night, sending naughty pics, insisting I come over. Finally, I caved. Yes, I'm weak, spare me the lecture. This time was different. Rosetta was banged up, her face a barrage of bruises. Her eyes were puffy and red, her bottom lips split open. Bar fight, she said, while sucking my earlobes. Bitch got the worst of it. Bar fight. Clearly, this redhead was bad news. I wanted to leave right then and there. Should have, too. Then none of this would have happened. But it was too late. I was trapped. She led me into her bedroom. We did the dirty, then I left, having no intention of speaking to her again. This time I meant it. The redhead kept sending naughty pics but I ignored them. After a week or so, I thought she'd gotten the hint. Her messaging stopped. Then out of the blue. Ding. My phone flew off the couch. Rosetta's name splashed across the screen. I groaned. She sent me a song. A song which has haunted me ever since. I put a spell on you. Not the popular version, but a much darker and sinister sounding one. I disliked it immediately. I replied, saying I was super busy, which was true, and that we should remain friends, which was not true. Her response gave me chills. Ermine. Things escalated. I work at a local music shop. The following day, my boss greeted me harshly. He seemed upset. Look at this. He handed me an old velvet on fire poster. I gasped. Then I tripped and fell backwards, knocking over an entire row of guitars. You idiot, my boss snapped. That's coming off your pay. Grudgingly, I gathered the guitars and checked for dings, but my mind remained on the poster. Or more accurately, the note written on the back of it. Ermine, the poster was nailed to the door. My boss scoffed, shaking his head. People these days. My mind went sideways. The note was written in Rosetta's rosy lipstick. Was she stalking me? Who would do such a thing? Making matters worse, later that week, Mick messaged me with a song request. I put a spell on you. Coincidence, I told myself. But I didn't believe it. Sometime later, I met a lovely woman named Melanie, who was cute and timid and polite. She dressed modestly and wore little to no makeup. She was the antithesis of Rosetta. Since Falling Forward were due to perform that weekend, I invited her to the show. 
Melanie was delighted. As the weekend grew nearer, so did my anxiety. This was a terrible idea. We were playing the same hole in the wall as before. Rosetta would certainly be there. How would she react to seeing me with another woman? Maybe, I hoped, she would get the hint and leave me the hell alone. Oh, how naive I was. Melanie sat up front. She seemed in good spirits. But I was nervous. I kept scanning the bar, looking for you-know-who. Then, as the band launched into I Put a Spell on You, a cold shiver slid down my spine. The barroom turned cold as ice. The redhead. She sat next to Melanie. I nearly died. During set break, I remained on stage, acting busy. Truth is, I was panicking. How could I be so stupid? The last thing I wanted was a confrontation. On cue, the redhead came rushing over. With beers, she offered me one. I said thank you, then awkwardly sat with Melanie, who kept asking if I was okay. I wasn't. My pits were soaked with sweat. I was tripping over my words, barely able to speak. All I could do was sip my beer and pray something dreadful didn't happen. The redhead, meanwhile, was tapping the table with her razor-like nails, staring at me. Her cold and calculated glare gave me the creeps. Finally, under the weight of the world, I excused myself and went to the bar. Before my drink arrived, a pair of icy fingers fondled my private parts. Hey, handsome. Rosetta's face was fiery red. Her lips, like blackened cherries, pursed into a scowl. She cracked her knuckles twice, then nodded towards Melanie. Who's the bitch? Her hand reached down, cupping my ever-shrinking testicles. Well, you see, I... She squeezed. Whoa, I freed myself. Then I scooted off to the restroom, away from prying eyes. This is nuts, I told myself, splashing cold water on my face. Obviously, the redhead wasn't playing with a full deck. But what could I do about it? I certainly couldn't ask her to leave, and I wasn't about to ignore Melanie. I was exasperated. I took a deep breath, then returned to the table. Melanie was frantic, her eyes trembling with terror. Apparently, Rosetta paid her a visit. I could only assume it went poorly. How dare you, Melanie spat. She marched out of the bar, leaving me with the bill and without a date. You don't need that bitch, Rosetta snickered. You're mine. Her hands booped my buttocks. Nick, sensing trouble, meandered over. Time to play, bro, he said. The band opened with New Orleans is sinking, a local bar band favorite. Everyone was dancing and singing along, including Rosetta, who jumped on stage and started grinding against me, plunking the bass strings. Then she tried pouring a full beer down my throat. Instead, she soaked the stage and my bass with suds. Whooping and hollering, she slipped and stumbled off the stage, resulting in a fantastic face plant, taking a few patrons with her. It was a total debacle. A fight broke out. Soon thereafter, she got ejected, and the band was barred from ever performing there again. The following day, I received a long-winded text from Melanie. Apparently, Rosetta threatened to kill her if she ever spoke to me again. Yikes. Then the redhead went on to disparage my reputation. Not good. Melanie concluded by saying she was busy and that we should just be friends. Oh, bittersweet irony. I was heartbroken and furious. Ding. The redhead. I put a spell on you. Ding. Because they're mine. I responded hastily. We are over. In fact, we never were. To further drive home the point, I added, Please stay away. I blocked her. Things settled for a while. Life went back to normal. Then my credit card bill arrived. This must be a mistake, I cried. Only it wasn't. After an arduous hour, chatting with the credit card company, their conclusion was concrete. Someone was using my credit card to purchase pricey perfume, clothes, leather boots, and accessories. The redhead. I spent the day chatting with the cops, who offered little help. The redhead was ruining my life, and it was up to me to stop her. But how? She denied everything, of course, and scolded me for such ludicrous accusations. Then she invited me back to her place. The nerve of this woman. The following week, the unthinkable happened. 
I was heading to bed when Dexter, my adorable Dalmatian, started going berserk. He should have been sleeping, cuddled in his cozy kennel in the yard, not barking. Cursing the mangy mutt, I went out back to check on him. The night was moonless and stark. A chill crept into my bones as I crunched along the yard. The gate was open, which was odd. It should have been locked. While locking the gate, I detected a smattering of sweet-smelling perfume. The redhead. Dexter calmed down after gobbling some tasty treats. Meanwhile, I scanned the yard, searching for intruders. Then I stormed inside, angry and confused. Sleep couldn't come. How could it? My mind kept returning to the redhead and what deplorable deeds she was doing. The following morning, I went outside to feed the dog. My heart was pounding like a kick drum at a heavy metal concert. Quickly, I panicked. Something was wrong. First off, the gate was open. Again. Plus, Dexter was being quiet. Too quiet, which is unlike him. As I inched cautiously towards the kennel, the sweet smell of perfume grew stronger. When I reached the kennel, I gasped. My heart sank into my shoes. Before me was Dexter, stewing in a pool of blood and gore. On the back, scribbled in crimson-colored blood, was a note. Ermine, I vomited. Connor, my roommate, was glaring at me from the kitchen, his eyes searing with suspicion. When I told him what happened, he turned ghost white. Then he called the cops, who again were of little help. I was unhinged. Terrible thoughts tore through my troubled mind. Why Dexter? What did he do to deserve such a fate? And why me, for that matter? I'm not a bad guy. Then, with a heavy heart, I buried my dead dog Dexter. The feeling of being watched was impossible to ignore. Somewhere close was the redhead taunting me. Proving this, a song wafted through the crisp, early morning air. I put a spell on you. Ding. Unknown sender. With shaky movements, I found my phone and shrieked. On my phone was a picture of me burying Dexter. Ding. Er, next. I raced into the house and locked all the doors. Grief held me in its terrible grip while I wept. This was all too much, too fast. Ding. Sign. I looked down and nearly died. I put a spell on you, my phone read. Because er, mine. I had a guy who showed up in my college in between my classes. We went to colleges in two different cities, and this was only two, three days after the first date. He managed to figure out my entire class schedule from. Things I mention offhand like, oh, I have to wake up early tomorrow for my 8 a.m. class. Or, my French has gone downhill, I'm going to do so badly in that class reading my school's class requirements to figure out what the freshman required classes are, going through every post on my Facebook wall to read posts from friends that gave him more clues on what classes I'm taking, sneaking through my bag when I went to the bathroom while we were on a date and to check out what I was reading when he arrived. Huge nerd, I carry study material everywhere. The fact that I asked for calc help and he found out I was taking Calc 3 for engineering students, and it was a more advanced class than what he was taking. Going through my university's class list and map to figure out likely class combinations. I nearly screamed when I saw him there. Creepy guy. Wanted to dump him on the second date, but he pulled the I'm depressed card, and I was young enough to buy it at that time. Lasted three painful months. I was going to drive from D.C. to Charlotte, North Carolina alone. I figured, why not post in the rideshare section to get some company and gas money? A guy messages me saying that he's interested in joining me for the ride, but he lives in Richmond, Virginia. No problem. Richmond is on the way. I respond with some information about myself and my interests, seeing as though I'm planning to spend several hours with this guy. He replies asking if we can drop off a duffel bag in Petersburg, Virginia. It sounds a bit suspicious, but sure, I tell him, no problem. We're three days away from the day we're supposed to leave. He messages me saying that he's not sure if he can go anymore because he's still waiting to hear back from his probation officer. He then goes on telling me how much of a bitch she is for making him check in 
and that he shouldn't even be required to notify her before he leaves the state of Virginia. I didn't reply. I was on a flight back from Thailand. We were flying to Detroit via Toronto. Well, a major storm had us stuck in Toronto for a day and a half. Every flight it seemed like we might leave then, at the last second we wouldn't. I got to talking to a few people because we kept seeing each other for every possible flight out. Finally, I tell this guy I've been chatting with man of this. We're only a few hours from Detroit. I'm renting a car, he said. Yeah, me too. I said, well, if you want to save money, we can just share a car. I could see from the look on his face that his butthole puckered hard enough to make diamonds. He no doubt thought I was bringing in drugs and would land him in prison for life. Obviously, we drove separately. He was sort of vindicated. For each possible flight, we had to go through customs each time, which meant I had what looked like about six trips from United States to Canada in two days, with Thailand thrown in as well. You better believe they searched the living shit out of my car at the border, like four hours of searching. When I, female, was 19, I was looking for a room to rent in the city I was moving to for college. It was about an hour away from my family. I wasn't having much luck and my mom started helping me look for a place. She found an ad on Craigslist for a room for $300 in a house, everything included. The homeowner was a man, and he rented the additional rooms upstairs to other women while he lived in the finished basement. The ad stated he rarely ever saw the other roommates because he had a kitchen and his own entrance downstairs, and that he preferred women because he had issues with male roommates in the past partying and causing damage. We decided to take a look since it was the cheapest that we could find in the area. My mom and I went to the house to view it. Decent house, decent neighborhood. He opened the door and was very welcoming. He was middle-aged and the kitchen and living room were furnished nicely and clean. My mom loves to talk and get to know people, so they were engaged in conversation while I stood there quietly and observed the place. He then said he would show me my room. We head towards the staircase to go up as I thought. Since he said on the phone, my room was upstairs with the other roommates, but he opens another door and we follow. He takes us down to the basement and opens a door to a very small room, no closet and no windows. He proceeds to say this is my room and I will be sharing the bathroom in the hallway with him. And his bedroom did not have a door on it. I was definitely thinking absolutely not, this is weird, but they were so deep in conversation that I couldn't interject. He then leads us to the upstairs and shows us the other rooms, which the doors were open and says they are currently rented. He then starts telling us elaborate stories about the other women, not very nice stories describing drinking problems. My mom was listening intently, but I took the time to investigate further. I looked in all three rooms and the bathrooms. There was furniture, but not a single item in there that looked like it belonged to a woman. No clothes or anything, only men's clothes in one of the closets. He had no problem with me creeping around his tenants' rooms without their permission. I then heard him tell my mom that he has some of his stuff in their closets, but they don't mind. And I'm just like, um, why the hell would a tenant pay you for you to use their space as storage? I was feeling really uncomfortable and started moving them back downstairs as they talked. My mom had mentioned when we arrived that her and my dad were going on vacation the next week, but I couldn't go because I had to work. He brought it up again, and that I should come by the next week and have dinner with him and the roomies to see if we would all get along. I said sure and we left. As soon as we got in the car, I told my mom I would definitely not be living there. She was dumbfounded. I had to explain to her not only did he lie about the room I would be in, that I was not supposed to be in the basement with him as well as share a bathroom with him, and he didn't even have a damn door, but also, did she not notice how no one else even lived there? She still didn't get it, and thought I was just being paranoid and thought he was nice and it was a cheap deal. I had to explain it to my stepdad and get him to tell her by no means would I be living there. I tried to report the post, but by the time we got home that day, he removed it. I think he planned on murdering me at dinner or abducting me and holding me hostage in that basement room that had no way to escape. I hope that guy hits a tree with his car one day. Edit. Some details have been coming back to me since I've been answering all of your questions. This happened in 2011, so it's been quite a while. When he took us upstairs, there was a wide landing that was surrounded by the rooms. As soon as we go up there, he motions towards one of the rooms and started this long, intricate story about the woman who lived in there and talking about her alcoholism and a crazy ex. He was very exaggerated in how he talked with a lot of gestures. My mom stood there listening to him. I don't know if it was sheer distraction or she didn't want to be rude not listening, but either way, I don't recall her ever having a good look around those rooms. I went and looked. All doors were open, had neatly made beds with dark wood bed frames, bureaus with mirrors and nightstands. There were sliding mirror closets, 
and they were empty except for one had men's clothes hanging pushed against one corner. Nothing was on the nightstands other than a lamp, and nothing on the bureaus. I went into the bathrooms, and there was nothing on the vanity in them other than hand soap. I looked in the showers, too, but nothing other than bar soap. The bedroom on the left had an empty suitcase laying open on the middle of the bed. This was one of the rooms with the empty closet. After seeing all this, I came back onto the landing and started slowly heading down the stairs. They were still talking and absentmindedly followed me down to the living room. That's when he mentioned dinner and we left shortly after. I think that's why my mom didn't notice a lot and didn't believe me at first. She didn't take more than a quick glance upstairs and when we were in the basement he was just as his talkative. A commenter on here who works with law enforcement pointed out this was probably a sex trafficking situation. The bedroom in the basement is where a victim is kept, drugged, and abused until broken and then trafficked. I honestly think this is more plausible with the situation as well as my city is actually a hotspot for that. I'm so grateful we got out of there and I hope my experience could help someone one day notice the details and get out of the situation safely. Stay safe and blessed people. Could use a throwaway, but it's also not really a big deal. I thought I was bisexual for the longest time because I always had an interest in guys since high school. Not in any other way than I wanted to try giving head. Well, sure enough, I took to good old Craigslist to find a suitor for my request. Found a guy, texted, and he drove down and I met him in his car. That wasn't really anything but a simple transaction. Just a blow and go type arrangement. But I realized as soon as I put it in my mouth that I was without a doubt, 100% undeniably straight. The thing is, he didn't take too kindly to me not finishing him and said that he had put the child locks on the door and I wasn't allowed to leave. Thankfully, either he forgot or was bluffing, but I tried the door and booked it into someone's backyard. I wasn't so much frightened as I was trying to get the taste in my mouth. Sold an iPhone on about three years ago and met the buyer in a grocery store parking lot. The dude looked precisely like one of the cousins from Breaking Bad, even down to the boots. He told me if there was anything wrong with the phone, there were ways of finding me. He then tried to give me $75 less than what we agreed to. When I corrected him, he stared me down for about 15 seconds, then handed the remaining money to me. After that show of bravery, I immediately changed my number, deleted that email, and haven't been on Craigslist since. Trust me when I tell you this. Don't use Craigslist. I know that may be obvious. It's not ideal meeting up with a stranger and giving them money and giving them your address or going to their house. About a week ago, I decided I needed a new phone. I chose to look on Craigslist. I found the perfect deal, a new iPhone 12 for only 400 bucks. What a steal. I tried to contact the person that is selling the iPhone, but he didn't respond. Well, that's weird, but I didn't think much about it. Over the next couple of days, I continued to message him, but he still didn't respond. But finally, he did. He only sent me his address, and only his address, which was weird. When I responded, he didn't say anything after that. So, the next day, I decided to go to this guy's house, which was a really stupid move looking at it now. When driving down the rocky street, it seemed like nobody lived in any house on the street. But ignoring that red flag, I went to his house. Seeing the house, it was dark, the wood was old and uneven. But once again, I ignored that as well. When walking to the front door, I noticed the grass was uncut and rough, it went up to my knees. When I approached the front door, it just swung open, which startled me. Hey! What the hell? I said, almost falling on the rocky floor. Do you want the phone or not? A man said in a deep and dark voice. Uh, yeah, I have $400 in cash. Is that what you want? I spoke. Yeah, that'll work, he said. I walked up and gave him the money. He snatched it from me and slammed the door in my face. I started to yell. Hey, man, what the F? I said, angered. He didn't open the door for what it seemed like hours. But when he finally did, he just stuck his arm out with the phone. After I grabbed it and thanked him, after I said, Oh, by the way, what's your name? He paused, then he said, John, John Smith. After that, I turned around and walked away, but I didn't hear him close the door. When I turned on my car, I looked at the door I saw him. I saw him still staring at me. Creeped out, I put all my weight on the gas pedal and floored it down the street. When I got home, I was way too tired to actually set up the phone. I fell asleep once my head hit the pillow. When I woke up and I turned the phone on, but I noticed something strange, something unusual. I noticed that the phone was still signed in with the last person, probably the creepy guy that sold it to me. So feeling a little nosy and curious, I opened the phone. What an idiot, I said laughing. 
That guy didn't even have a password. This is too easy, I thought. After opening the phone and going to the home page, I immediately went to the Photos app. After opening the app, there was nothing. There were no photos in the camera roll. Weirded out, I went to the photo albums, and then when I found something... The photo album was titled, A Fun Night with a Winking Emoji. At first, I thought the pictures or videos in there would be very different, but they weren't. There were only two videos, both with a black thumbnail. Then I did something I regret. I played the first video. When the first video started to play, it was a black screen. The only sound I heard was soft rain. After a few seconds, the camera quickly panned up. It made me jump. It was so quick and sudden. The camera was turned to look at a car outside. The camera stayed fixed on that car for more than 30 seconds. What the hell is this? I thought to myself, confused. Then a woman actually opened the car door and got out of the car. I did not know this woman, nor have I seen her. After the camera wouldn't move away from her, a man started laughing. In a maniacal tone, then he said, Can't wait to have a fun night with you, he said in a scratchy voice. That's when I stopped my breath. I knew that voice. That voice was the same as the man that sold me this damn phone. Thoughts began racing in my mind. Was he a murderer? I thought, is this video a prank? After the first video ended, I went to the second video. I noticed this one was exponentially longer than the first one. While the first one was two minutes long, this one was seven minutes. The same thing happened like in the first one. It started out as a black screen with rain in the background. But the difference was it was in an abandoned warehouse. Then around 45 seconds in, I heard soft, quite crying, cries of a woman. Shut your mouth, the same man yelled. She stopped immediately. The camera panned to look at the woman. He stood the camera up against the wall of the warehouse. She was the same woman that got out of the car. I started to become lightheaded because of this. Is this a sick joke? I thought, did he actually kidnap her? Then, the man reached his arm out to caress her knee. She started to whimper like a sad dog. Then, right after she started to cry, he slapped her right in the face. Shut up, I said in a loud and demanding tone. Once again, she stopped. The man then grabbed a knife out of his pocket and cut the rope around her mouth. She started panting and breathing really heavy. The man then said in a maniacal tone, I want to have a little fun. In one swift motion, he pushed the woman down and brought the knife up to her chin. He moved the knife around her jawline. Blood started to leak out under her chin. Then he dropped the knife and started to choke her. She started to turn purple. Then she became lifeless. He then picked up the knife and started to carve a wide smile in her face. After he finished the smile, he grabbed the camera and showed her wide and bloody smile. He started laughing and said, wasn't this fun? After seeing this, I jumped out of my bed and drove to the police station. After I gave the police the phone, they figured out the man and the woman in the videos. For legal reasons, I will just say their first names. The man's name is Dale, and the woman's name was Jesse. The man was convicted of murder and is now in prison for life. The woman sadly died from blood loss. Like I said in the intro, don't use Craigslist. I was selling a used washer and dryer on Craigslist after the house I bought already had a washer and dryer, so selling the old ones I brought from my apartment. I had them for $100 each, which was a steal for the make and model of each with just a single year of use. I sent additional photos for one buyer and we agreed on $90 each if he bought both. He shows up in his truck and I'm foolish enough to help him load them in the back of his truck before getting paid, the moment he closed the tailgate of the truck. Hey man, will you take $70 each? I told him we already agreed on a price, but he got angry with me for holding him to it saying he already loaded them and did not want to unload them. I opened his tailgate, which made him begin to shout for me to not touch his truck. I ignored him and began undoing the ratchet straps before he pulled out the full $180 in cash paid me and drove off shouting at me in front of my neighbors. Dozens of great experiences on Craigslist. Some try to haggle on arrival, but most have been cool when I refused. Worst I've had thankfully. In college, my girlfriend at the time and I needed to find an apartment for only one semester, which was impossible to find affordably in a college town. We ended up looking on Craigslist and living in a two-bro with this guy. Let's call him Dirty Dan. Dirty Dan was in his early 30s. He was pretty much a stereotype nerd, really tall and chubby, a gross beard and really long gross hair. Love. Dungeons and dragons and video games and stuff like that. But he seemed nice and he had a fully furnished apartment and the rent was low. Dirty Dan became a terror to us. 
Here are some of his traits. His nice demeanor turned out to be the stereotype nice guy behavior. He was low-key an asshole and thought that acting polite entitled him to female attention. He didn't go to school or work because he received social security for some undisclosed medical problem, which meant he never left the house, ever. Which would be one thing, but... He never left the living room, despite having his own large bedroom. He spent all of his time in there, including constantly falling asleep on the couch for hours and snoring. We basically could not use the living room unless we wanted to hang out with him, which we didn't because he drove us crazy. When we had friends over and did use the living room, he would just sit there awkwardly and silently on his computer while we were hanging out or watching a movie with them. Then he would try to watch Let's Play videos on his laptop with the volume up and no headphones while we were all there, or he would fall asleep while we were all watching a movie and snore. He also only lay down, never sat up, so he always took up half the couch. He would invite himself to things we were doing like we would be leaving to go somewhere, and he would just leave with us and invite himself. He got into some polyamorous relationship with two incredibly annoying girls. They would always be over in the living room too, and they spent most of their time discussing their sex life loudly or looking at BDS and porn on his YE internet browser. He acted super creepy to any female friend we brought over, and as soon as they left would try to friend them on Facebook and hit on them, he would drink all our alcohol. He was super passive-aggressive, bitchy, and paranoid. He became convinced that we were legitimately going to try and steal his cats after we made a passing joke about it. He was totally filthy. Wore the same like thermal man leggings and t-shirt every day. The bathroom and fridge were disgusting when we moved in and if we didn't diligently clean them, he would let them become disgusting again. We grew to basically spend all our time in the apartment in our room and absolutely hate having to interact with him. He had no social graces at all and was passive, aggressive bitchy, and I heard more about his mountain troll sex life than anyone should. Kill Dirty Dan. Had just bought an old house, needed some roommates to help pay the bills. It was pre-GFC, and I doubt the bank would have lent me $300 plus on a $35 scalery today. The few people who responded included a girl who wanted to know where she could put her five wardrobes and another girl who wanted to know what equestrian facilities I was offering, even though I kept telling her that its only equine link was that there were horses in a paddock on the other side up. The road, okay, but do you have an arena? How many seats does it have? Eventually, I was forced to lower my already very low standards and took on some very subpar housemates. Housemate one was as skinny as a rake and took my hay. I'm cool. You can smoke whatever in the big shed if you want. To mean, hey, why don't you and all your mates spend every night in the shed blasting Metallica through tiny speakers, leaving bongs everywhere and using my jars of nuts and nails as target practice? Housemate 2 seemed like a better candidate. He was unmarried, morbidly obese in between jobs, but was a qualified former chemical engineer with no pets. Only he wasn't. Firstly, the day before he moved in, he admitted that he had a Maltese Terrier, and had intentionally not mentioned it because he hadn't been able to find a place that would let him have a pet. I hate yappy dogs, but to if credit, it was pretty chill. Later, I discovered that qualified chemical engineer's code for once worked at a paint factory. Then he started bringing very young boys into his room at random hours, who he introduced as his nephews, even though they very clearly were not. As if that wasn't disturbing enough, they actively avoided me and did not look or talk to anyone else in the house as if they had been instructed to stay quiet. He and his dog would spend the entire day sleeping in his room, as in, he may emerge once or twice a day to use the bathroom or kitchen, but that was it. The dog had a bowl which he kept full of food at all times, which brought in mice from outside. I asked him to feed his dog by putting food in it once a day, and he informed me that it wouldn't be possible as the dog likes to snack. I told him that the mice had to go, and if that meant his dog had to go, then so be it. He took the bowl away. Predictably, this made him get even bigger. He must have been more than 200 by this stage, but it wasn't caused by him sleeping all day. He blamed it on the chemicals at the paint factory he once worked at. In fact, he was trying to get a disability pension so he wouldn't have to work again. Eventually, the arguments between Metallica housemate and Lazy housemate over the late night music got to the point where Lazy housemate took out an AVO against Metallica housemate because he threatened to stab his dog when he shouted at him to turn the music down. I decided the drama wasn't worth two X $100 per week, so I kicked them both out.
A dear friend of mine who has since passed away hired a gardener through Craigslist. The gardener robbed him when my friend went to a different state for a wedding and kidnapped my friend's roommate. Gardner stole his car, drove his stuff and the roommate to another state, dropped it off with Gardner's brothers where the roommate was held hostage for a day. The stuff, including plasma TV, was fenced during this time. My friend gets home from his wedding and his garage door is open. Other car is gone and no one in sight. He walks inside to find his two dogs locked in a closet having eaten pillows for food. They needed surgery later. He calls the cops. Later that evening, the roommate calls my friend for a payphone. He was released by the brothers after all the stuff was fenced. But the gardener took the car and led police on high-speed chase. The gardener spent some time in jail and sent my friend a Christmas car that year, apologizing. This story is completely true, and if anyone wants more deets, I can answer questions. It was told to me by my friend. I miss him very much at a restaurant in what I consider to be the greatest story ever told to me. It came up because one guy at the table was talking about how great Craigslist is, and my friend said, well, actually, let me tell you a story. In a really bad place of my life, meet a girl off Craigslist dated. Whole thing turned south pretty fast, but being in a really bad place in my life ignored all the warning signs. Broke contacted, Moved away, moved on with my life. A couple months later, she sent me a text saying, I know what you did. That's a felony. The cops will come after you. Now, being afraid, this woman, I called her and said what F. Apparently, someone posted a video of her onto one of those revenge porn sites. I told her I never did it and I'm happy now and don't want to be dragged down by her because I was happy now. Hung up and thought nothing of it. Fast forward two weeks and she sent me a long text message that she was the one that posted it there and was hoping it would be the attention she needed to bring me back into her life. That's when I changed my phone number. Depression and Craigslist dating do not mix. Was looking for roommates somehow this person thought I was a girl. Kept sending d-pics and I kept texting. I am a dude. He was like, sure girl. The things I would do, blah, blah. Finally, I had enough told this guy come to my house. Idiot shows up with flowers. I come out and tell, look, I'm a dude, not a chick. He tells me, tease throws the flowers on the ground. I sat there just shocked. Guy sends me a text a week later, wish you would have been a girl with all that teasing. I was about 15 and had $115 from saving an Xmas money. I was looking through listings for guitars and someone had posted a Squire Telecaster for $100. I text the number saying I'm interested. Guy says he still has it, but wants 120 for it. I respond saying 110 is as high as I want to go. He says 120 or nothing. I respond saying that if that was the price amount, he then proceeded to text me for three days, calling me an asshole and a piece of shit for not buying a guitar from him and how good of a deal it was. Saturday rolled around and the texts had stopped, but around 11 of them, I started getting calls. He was drunk and still mad. At that point, blocked his number. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.